um, in the other building. And we will have children's church today for ages three through second grade. Um, and they will get dismissed before the sermon begins. Um, I also have a few f announcements to make you aware of. Um, grab a flyer out on the table out there if you haven't already about the Vine Arts Fest. That'll be July 27th. Um, so there's information on this little flyer. And then also, if you are the artistic type and would like to participate um, by actually creating your own original piece of art, there is another flyer that gives you more information about that. And just want to make you aware that the deadline for that is July 14th. So if that's something you might be interested in doing, grab a piece of paper, read more about it, and plan your, your artistic endeavors to be done by July 14th <laughs> for that. Um, what else do I need to tell you? There's a table in the foyer that has other information that you can check out. And I am going to read Psalm chapter 62, verses 1 through 8. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. At this time, we'll have a moment of silence for personal prayer and reflection. Um, and I will lead us out of that time of silence um, with the Lord's Prayer that we'll recite together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Man, good morning, church. Man, if you're able, would you stand with us? And what, <laughs> one thing I try to do as an educator is, just, hey, here's where we're headed today. I don't want anything to be a surprise. I tell my students, you don't, I don't want you to be surprised. I want you to know where we're going. Uh, where we're headed <laughs> is to put the name of Jesus on your lips. That's what this is all about. So, Maybe give you a little bit of hope where something maybe seems hopeless. Maybe to give voice, to give vocabulary to something that's been stirring or brewing deep in your heart or in the back of your mind, something that's been just kind of niggling back there. You know, I feel this thing and I don't know what it is. Maybe you'll give some vocabulary, some voice to that. And I once heard somebody say, um, when we hear speaking, you know, it's easy sometimes for it to go in one ear and out the other. Say, but with art, with music, with songs, you can say the exact same thing. And it sneaks around and comes in the back door and gets stuck there. And that's also one of my goals, is that something that we sing, some words, some piece of hope, some declaration about the love of God for you, will sneak around in the back door and get stuck there stick with you throughout this week as a reminder of how valuable you are, how much God loves you. He's for you. He sees you. He knows you. He desires you to know him better. So let's sing together this morning. Let's pray together. Let's celebrate together as well. I've carried a burden long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone hear your 
Life, you have been so. 
and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And he said, that's, that's an okay translation. Let's stay in that key for a minute, see. But a better translation is that it's not just following me. Your goodness and mercy is pursuing me. I want to sing these words again and think about that. Your goodness, your mercy, as the psalmist writes, is, is, is pursuing me. God is chasing us down with his goodness and his mercy. It's not just, oh, well, it's going to follow along behind. He talked about with his dog. The dog followed him around the house. He said, no, God's goodness and mercy doesn't just follow along like my dog. God's goodness and mercy is pursuing me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Put that in the back of your mind, and let's sing these words again. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Sing it again. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. One more time. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down. choose just just connect Carrie just read from Psalm 62 and I didn't know she was going to read that I had no idea I hadn't seen the list yet uh, but it the Holy Spirit knows God knows <laughs> and I forget that a lot of the time because some of the words she just read are some of the words we're going to sing and pray together here in just a moment let all that I am Wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. 
He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. We're going to sing those very words here in just a moment. <laughs> and we're going to sing and remind ourselves, remind each other that Christ, Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. When everything around is shaken, man, everything else can crumble and fall. And I feel really bold standing up here saying these words because I don't always feel it. I don't always believe it. But everything else crumbles and falls if I still have Jesus. That's the foundation I need. I listened to a podcast recently, actually this morning, the guy, <laughs> selling Bridget. The guy who uh, has been in the Christian music industry, as gross as that term is, and he said after he just got disillusioned with it all. And he said, the one thing that I did not lose, anything else, everything else I can question, but I'm not going to question Jesus because he is so, so good. All my life he has been faithful. He is worthy of every song that we could ever sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name of all. Jesus, the name
is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand, everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why? that way for, for you, for someone in here. I don't know. I don't know everybody here. But if that's, if that's what it feels like, hold on to Jesus. He won't fail. Everything else may crumble. He won't fail. We look 
to you, Jesus, the, the beginner, the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith, the one who holds all things together. Thank you that you're here, that you're always with us. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see you at work, to see how you desire to come alongside to mend broken hearts. Blessed source of joy, carve out room in us for the inexpressible delights of love. Let our hearts become fountains overflowing into the world with your love and compassion. Help us to pause each day and whisper thank you for the most ordinary graces and gifts. In the way that you looked upon your creation and called everything so good, kindle in us that kind of generous vision. Lift us beyond our narrow concerns and help us to see how there is no separation. We are all connected. Support us in honoring our bodies as sacred temples and losing ourselves in the great cosmic dance. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, at this time, if we have kids who are going to Children's Church, that's ages three years old through second grade, please head out. My beautiful wife, Carrie, will be having fun with you guys. So, um, Well, before I introduce our speaker this morning, I want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge a couple of events that we had uh, the last couple of weeks. So yesterday was Temple Pride Fest, and the Saturday before that was uh, the Colleen Pride Fest. And uh, I had, uh, myself and Carrie, had the opportunity to kind of help organize the Vine being there. And uh, I want to I take a moment to just express my uh, thanks and gratitude for any of you who came out to uh, kind of help talk to people at these events about the Vine. A number of you were there. Uh, I especially want to thank Pam Darkus. Pam was actually there before Carrie and I arrived both days and helped us load our car as we were leave leaving both days. <laughs> so Pam, thank you so much for your time and attention and enthusiasm. Um, one of the reasons why I really feel strongly about those two events is because of uh, there are a lot of people who have been hurt by the church and hurt by people who carry the name Christian. And um, I feel like it is one of the most important things that we as the vine can do to show them Christ in a different way. Um, the LGBTQ community is a community that has been persecuted, that has been hurt, that has been ridiculed and um, and that's not Christ-like under any belief system. That's not Christ-like. And uh, so we wanted to take some time uh, the last two Saturdays to reach out to the community to let people know that we're here and that we love and want, to, want them to, to know that God loves them as well, that they're not outcast, they're not um, lesser than, and... Um, and yesterday we had the opportunity, and last Saturday, the last two Saturdays, we've had the opportunity to do that, and it's been wonderful. I can't tell you how many people came up to our table and were just like, are, are you sure you know where you are? And we're like, yeah, we know where we are. We're good. <laughs> 
and, and a number of people who said, I didn't know that churches like this existed. And we said, well, we do. <laughs> and we're glad to, to, you know, share some lemonade and popsicles and whatever else. And so it was a really good time. Again, thank you to everybody who came out each of the last two Saturdays. If you didn't, next June we'll be doing the same thing. Um, and so uh, feel free to, to join in and, and, uh, and come and have a good time and, you know, get hot and sweaty. <laughs> but it was good. Yeah, yeah, for Jesus. Yeah, hot and sweaty for Jesus. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good T-shirt. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, well, with that said, uh, I want to now introduce our, uh, our speaker this morning, bringing us the word of God. Uh, Dr. Jude Austin is a very good friend of mine. Um, we, we work together now, and um, I, I first met Jude when he was a student, um, when I was coming to interview for my job that I have today, and now he's a, a colleague that I work with, and, um, and a really good guy, a really good friend, and um, I really appreciate everything that, that uh, he means to me in my life. And uh, uh, Jude, if you wouldn't come up here, I'm, I'd like to say a word of blessing over you and, and then turn things over to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together, to uh, fellowship with each other, to uh, build each other up, and to learn uh, more about your will in our lives. Today, I ask that you bless the word that, uh, your word that Jude will be bringing us this morning. We ask that you, um, that you speak through him and uh, that your, your wisdom comes through him and hits our ears and moves our feet and moves our hands throughout the week. Thank you for him. Thank you for uh, his willingness to be here this morning. And uh, thank you for the other people who are here to listen and to uh, participate in this as well. We ask that you bless our time here. It's in your son's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. going to be an exam after this, so <laughs> hand out scantrons. <laughs> Thank you, man. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here, man. My name is Jude, uh, like Jason said, and I'm a friend of Pastor Warren and a friend of the church, um, and I love being here. I think the last time I preached was a year ago, around the same time, and um, I have one less baby and a lot more sleep. Uh, and so uh, he was up at 3 in the morning. Uh, so, if, you know, this is what you get. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm a licensed therapist, professor at UMHB, and I'm married to my beautiful wife, Lindsay. And we got three boys, uh, five, three, and then eight months. Um, they're all boys. So pray for my house and insurance. Because um, how I don't have a broken nose, it's just the grace of God. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my home church is the Vista Community Church in Tampa, where I get to serve as an elder, and, um, and so I'm so happy to be able to serve the community in that way. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, to say, man, if this is your first time here, I hope you feel welcome, warmed, and loved, because this is a good place with good people who love God and love people. Um, and so today, um, we're going to talk about a couple of different things, two things mainly. One, recognizing our anointed experiences. Um, and then the second thing is embracing those experiences and integrating them into what we do, right? I feel like God was working this morning because we didn't talk about song selections. We didn't talk about anything, but the kind of, you know, he's faithful through generations is going to ring true, I think, in this story. Um, I do have to wonder, <clears throat> you know, I'm a graduate professor. I'm used to teaching three-hour lectures, and um, they said I had 25 minutes, but I couldn't pare it down, so it's like two hours and 59 minutes. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Lock the doors. It's going to be lemonade. And <laughs> nah, man. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. Um, 
we need to do a couple of different things. Obviously, I have the whiteboard because I'm going to try to do something interesting, right? I've been kind of preparing for this lecture, for this sermon for like, gosh, man, a year, it feels like. Um, it's like a hobby of mine. Whenever I read things or watch things, I kind of take notes and then a sermon will form. I have like seven or eight of them uh, in the queue. And so I'm happy to do this one. Um, <clears throat> and I've noticed that there's a there was an interesting phenomenon that I think happens in my experience in therapy that I wanted to bring to you guys. It is, it's like, man, sometimes, sometimes you watch several different iterations of the human experience, and sometimes as a therapist, like I'm sure if there's other therapists in the, in the room, you start to recognize your stuff a little bit faster. I'm not saying that, like, now you have awareness and you've flown on off into insightful bliss with your partner. No, you still have to get through your stuff, and I stay off my stuff, but it, it helps. And I always thought, man, I can't give you guys 20 or 30 or 50,000 hours, however many hours I have. But what we can do, I think, is use the Bible as like an example of those things. Because those stories exist in the Bible. And sometimes if you dive into them, you can reflect on them and they hold up a mirror and show you who, who you are, but more importantly, how you are. Right? And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to cover... Um, the story of Judah and Tamar, and it's a story that's close to my heart. Um, <clears throat> I actually had several different stories and then texted a good friend, a pastor of mine in Portland, and he was like, you got to do this. Because I was telling him I was going to use Lazarus, but it didn't feel like grimy enough for what I'm going to talk about. And so I was like, it's on my heart to be gritty. And this is the story that kind of popped out. Right. So I'll start with this. I'll give you guys the takeaways, you know, kind of my teacher role as well. I want you guys to know what you're going to get, uh, and then I'll pray us into it. We'll read Genesis 38, and then I'll kind of talk through a little bit, right? Um, here's a takeaway, right? So, so God has anointed our brokenness, right? He's, a, he's anointed these experiences that has broken us and will break us all to move us closer to him, right? That's the whole point, right? Sometimes we can't see it, but that's the whole point. It's to move us closer to him. And we'll examine this story, and you guys will be able to see how just like the crazy cosmic kind of closeness and tugging like a magnet we can't escape, right? Like he's chasing us, right, through this story. So let me pray, and then we'll get into it. Um, Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, um, open our hearts and minds to your message, God. Um, help us see the beauty in our anointed brokenness through the story of Judah and Tamar. Guide us to embrace your transformative power uh, in our lives, understanding that you are always working to bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I feel like time is ticking. I have like a time right here, a timer right there, and so I'm going to try to do this quickly because I got about three hours of information to cover in 25 minutes. Right? So for context, we're going to be in Genesis 38. Right? That's where we're going to stay. But it helps me to understand the history a little bit. Because right? remember, I'm going to try to talk through the Bible, but then I'm also going to take us into therapy, like how I would see this as a therapist. Right? So for context, in Genesis 38, in Genesis 37, we know of Judah. Right? Judah was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, right? the 12, like the 12 tribes of Israel. So Judah was one of those, those uh, brothers. Right? Remember the story where those brothers tried to sell, they sold Joseph into slavery, right? Um, and so one of the twelves, they had a couple ideals. They looked around and they noticed, man, like Jacob, our dad is like favoriting Joseph. We got to do something about it. There's some insecurities that creep in there, and they tried to do something about it. They had some plots. One is to kill him. The next one is to throw him in a pit, and then... Uh, Judah said, how about we sell them to these Egyptian slave traders for about 20 pieces of silver? And y'all, I didn't really understand this until I had three boys. Now, once I had three boys, I was like, I can see it. I can absolutely, I can absolutely see it. Uh, it's like the Thunderdome. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's what's happening, right? Now, at the same time this is happening, right? So, you know, Joseph gets sold, right, for 20 pieces of silver. You have Judah who, I don't know, I, they didn't really say this in the Bible, but it, I, I'm assuming that he felt some type of way 
because at the same time, he goes back and he leaves his family, right? He goes to a different tribe um, where he settles near an Adulamite named Hira. This is like Genesis 38, verse 1. And while he was there, he married Shua, right? So we have Judah and Shua, right? And this was a Canaanite lady outside of his tribe. And then they had three sons, Ur and an Onan and a Shelah, right? And that's where we pick up our story. But I thought to, to help you understand it, this is what I would do in therapy. If I'm meeting with this family and they're talking about this, I'm going to write a genogram on the board just so we all know what's going on. And so I'm going to do that here. Hey, don't laugh at my handwriting. One, and two, I can't spell. My PhD is in counseling, and so leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we got, we got Jacob, all right? And remember, Jacob here, remember he had four wives. We're not going to write them all down, but he had four wives, right? So we'll just say wife, right? And they had the 12 sons, right? So no order. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right, and let's just say for the sake of the board that Joe. That let's see, Jacob. Let's see, was here. Right, let's do Judah right there. Right, so we got this. Right. I think that's how you spell it. And then he married. Right, Shua. Right, and then they had their three boys. Right? Er, doing this from memory. Onan, correct me if I'm wrong. And then Sheila. Okay. Tell I went to Catholic school. It's like broken cursive and whatever. Okay. So that's what we're looking at, right? And we all have these, right? You can sit down and draw your genogram and you see it, right? And then as a therapist, we're looking at two different things. We're looking at the structure of the family, but also the interaction patterns, right? And so we'll see this kind of cosmic tugging, right, that God has to pull us closer to him in this story. So this is where we pick it up, right? So in uh, verse 30, uh, Genesis 38, verse 6 through 10, um, Judah got a wife for Ur, right, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Right. So if you want to, we can kind of draw this here. And this is going to be important because he marries. Right. Tamar. Right. And now it didn't explicitly say this, but or the reason um, why. But um, now it, in Ur, Judah's firstborn was evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord put him to death. Right. And so we don't know why, but he was evil and God put him to death. That's what we were doing in genogram. Right. And when he put him to death in verses eight through ten, then Judah said to Onan, the second son, sleep with your brother's wife, perform your duty as his brother in law and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his, with his brother's wives, he released his semen onto the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the sight of the Lord, so he put him to death also. All right? So we got Onan, who also married Shua, right? and then he was put to death also. So they're both evil in the sight of the Lord, and they were also put to death, right? And this is common practice. It's called a levy right marriage, right? And this was kind of law back then, where if you're the second son, your first, your brother gets married, and then you pass away, in order to keep the inheritances and things like that, then you would marry your sister-in-law, and then if you have a kiddo, then that kiddo then becomes like your brother's son. And that was Onan's kind of fear. It's like, I don't want to have my brother's kids. Like, I want my own stuff, you know? And also, I'm thinking, if he doesn't have kids, then won't I get a bigger share of the inheritance, right? And you see this trend in Jacob as well with his dad, right? And how he was favoriting Joseph, right? And so you see this trend, this family dynamic building from generation to generation here, right? 
And so, in verse 11, uh, then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. Um, for he thought he might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live with her fathers in her father's house, right? So you'll see Tamar do what we call distancing, right? If we're looking at the system here, then Tamar would have this kind of distant, because now she's living with her father in her father's house, right? And if you're, like, if you're Judah, you're thinking, man, what's up with Tamar? Like, <laughs> Given the two of them, you know, and they both pass away, and now I have my baby, my baby boy, Sheila. You know, my, my youngest son is named Shiloh, so you better believe when I read this, I was like, Kian, you better be okay, right? Uh, <laughs> I got two chances, you know? Uh, but, the, but the fear, right, you, you, can, you can imagine the fear, right, that Judah's experiencing, right? It's like, I'm going to lose what I have. And you see that in the previous generation with his brothers, right? That same fear kind of, kind of gets in there. And so um, <clears throat> imagine what Tamar is feeling, right? Like she gets taken, like, hey, look, just go live with your dad. When Sheila grows up, he's going to be yours. Don't worry about it, right? And in this case, Tamar is destitute, right? In order to kind of secure her back, so to speak, She's got to marry and have kids, right? And so she's with her dad, just completely trusting Judah, right? So she's just on faith, right? And so we pick it back up in Genesis 38, verse 14, right? So, um, so Tamar, she's struggling, man. She's isolated, rejected, right? And, and she has to make a move. And you'll see that move in verse 14, when she removed her widow's clothes, she veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance of Enaim, um, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila had grown up. Right? She had not been given to him as a wife. So at this time, Sheila's grown up, and she's seen him, a grown man, right? and she hasn't been given to him as a wife. So Judah didn't give him her. And so when Judah saw her, right, on the side of the road, he thought she was a prostitute, um, for she had covered her face. This was a couple years later. He didn't, he didn't know that this was his daughter-in-law. And so he went over to her and said, come, let me sleep with you, um, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, um, what will you give me for sleeping with me? And in 17, he says, I will send you a young goat from my flock, he replied. But she said, only if you leave something with me until you send it, right? Because at this point, she's, she knows Judah, right? She wants collateral. Like, you told me you would give me Sheila. I'm not about to wait for this goat. Like, you better believe I'm not about to wait for this goat, right? Like, give me something now, right? And so <clears throat> in 18, he says, um, Judah says, well, what should I give you, he asked. And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and your staff in your hand. Um, so he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. And at 19, um, she got up and left, then removed her veil and put her widow's clothes back on. Right? And now when I read this the first time, we're going to keep going, but when I read this the first time, I thought, man, we all have those signet rings, we all have those cords, we all have those staffs, those things that are ours, that so much symbolizes who we are. And you can see that. Our partners can see it. Our kids can see it, right? And this is going to come back, right? So in uh, 38 verses 24 through, through 26, about three months later, Judah was told, hey, your daughter-in-law Tamar has been acting like a prostitute, and now she is pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death, right? Just the the kind of righteous rage, self-righteous rage he has. No reflection at all to what he did and how he played a part in it, right? But that was his, that was his thought. And so I would imagine he's also thinking, well, this solves the problem. I don't have to give Sheila to her and risk him dying. So bring her out, and we'll burn her to death. And in verse 25, um, as she was being brought out, she sent, a, um, she sent her father-in-law this message. I am pregnant by the man 
to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? Right? And Judah recognized them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her my son Sheila, and he did not know her intimately again. Right? And now if I'm Tamar, I'm thinking, got him. I mean, and you ever have those moments where, like, God shows you yourself so clearly that you cannot unsee yourself, right? We all have those signet rings. We all have those cords. We all have those staffs where when put in front of us, we're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's on me. The kids do that, right? You know, I'm raising three boys, like I said, and I'm looking at them, and they're acting, and sometimes I'm like, why are you so old? Because I'm so because that's me. <laughs> you know, you see yourself reflected in that, right? In therapy, we call that the paradoxical theory of change. We don't have time to get into it, but I would, but we can't, but I want to, but we shan't. All right? And basically, it means once you become aware of something, you can't become unaware of it, right? So it's just there. And that's kind of what this family needs. You see the kind of unawareness and the actions from fear, the actions from deprivation, Right? That's happening from generation to generation. Right? And so we get to verse 27 through 30. In 27, when the time came for her to give birth, um, these were twin, there were twins in her womb. Right? Um, as she was given birth, one of them put out his hand, and the midwife took an entire scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first, but then he put his hand back out, and then out came his brother, and she said, uh, what a breakout you've made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied uh, to his hand, came out, and his name was Zerah, right? And so if we look back on the genogram, we see just this pattern of deprivation, conniving, jealousy, and how those things are wrapped around fear, right? And what fear does, does to us, right? It distorts the truth. Right? And a lot of times it causes us to, especially when we act on fear, it causes us to make actions or behaviors or thoughts that push us away from God. Right? And so here's the thing, because God is good, and so what he did through it all, right, faithful through generations, right, God still anointed this whole dumpster fire, right, <laughs> anointed these experiences um, because it was, through Perez's line that we get Jesus and so many other of our teachers, right? Uh, can somebody put the slide on the board? You can see a genogram up there. You can see that I'm kind of in the way. Maybe this board's in the way, but there's a screen back there. You'll see Judah, Tamar, Zara, Perez, and through Perez we have Selman, we have Boaz, Obed, Jesse, King David, Solomon, and then Jesus, right? So he knew the whole time Right? Now, if you're Tamar in your dad's house thinking, what's going to happen next? You have no idea of the cosmic impact that your courage and decisions can make. You have no idea. You're just sitting there, right? wrapped up in fear, trying to make the best decisions you can. Right? But he has a plan, and this plan is always to bring us closer to him, even if you can't feel it. Right? Okay, you can get that off because we're going to start breaking this stuff down. Right? So we're going to do two things, all right? I feel like I should ask, is there any questions? Like, that's what I would do in class. Uh, <clears throat> but, oh, let me write this down here because we'll see. Got the two boys, right? Just so we can see it. All right. Okay, so we're going to do two things. One, break it down. I'm going to talk through some of the ways that God has anointed experiences in this, in this story. And then I'm going to talk through how we can take those experiences and embrace them in our own lives and embrace them so that we can start taking steps towards God, right? So I've got three things here to break it down. Uh, the first thing is that in this story, man, um, God anointed their human fallibility, right? He anointed it. He kind of made it seem known to us if we look at this genogram. Right. And he did that so that he can set the stage for redemption. Right. God often uses our mistakes 
to teach us and bring us back to him, showing us that there's always a path to redemption if you can recognize what's happening. Number two, God anointed moments, and he does anoint moments of rejection and isolation, right? I mean, we've all felt like Tamar would imagine, right? Like, or you may not literally crawl back to your parents' house, but it may feel that way sometimes, right? Like, man, am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? You're getting rejected. You're feeling more alone than you ever felt, Right? And God anoints those experiences to bring us closer to him. He anoints those experiences because they pave the way for courage and initiative, right? And to be honest, man, most purpose, like most people's purpose is more burden than glory. And I think I had to really settle with that when I was reading this. Sometimes you can get into like, but where's the good stuff? And how did they do the thing? Like most of it is, is more burden than glory. Um, and we can't ignore that, right? We have to live through the burden and we have to make it make sense, right? Sometimes he puts these experiences in our way so that we can take bold steps of faith towards him, right? Even if it goes against social norms, even if it goes against your family of origin, right? Because there's so many things either one of them could have done that could have turned them into a scapegoat, right? Even if it goes against the norm. (coughs) Number three, God anointed. He anoints experiences of degenerativity, right? These these experiences where you feel like, man, is what I'm doing going to matter? Like, really, in my family, it's starting this job, it's doing this thing, it's reading the Bible, it's having time with myself. Is this stuff really going to matter? But he does. He anoints these, these experiences of, degeneration, of degenerativity um, because they pave the way for legacy, right? Tamar couldn't have known, she could not have known that this was going to lead, that her actions were going to lead towards, right, all of these characters in the Bible straight towards Jesus, right? She couldn't have known it. God's anointing, it often has far-reaching implications beyond just our immediate understanding, right? Um, And so those were the ways, and here's how I made sense of that, right, in in my life. These are things that I wish and that I think I would have maybe shared with them if they came into therapy, right? Which I don't know how much I would charge for this, but whew. (laughs) Man, I don't even know where to start. Um, But if they were in there, I think I would say a couple of things, right? Five things stood out to me as I was reading. Um, one, trusting the process, right, means that we have to trust. We have to have this unshakable trust that God is working in our lives, right? Even when it doesn't feel that way. Even when we experience his working as our triggers, right? In those moments of trigger, Right? Those are actually the moments that God has designed to move you closer to him. Right? I've never been more closer to God than when I've been triggered. Right? Like, God, please just don't let me punch these people. God, just please, just let me, just please. God. Like, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like, in those moments of, of, of trigger, of, of being plugged into your stuff, you've never been closer to him. And I think we have to recognize that. Right? Even when those moments are like, a baby crying at 3 a.m., and you feel like this baby is doing some kind of Navy SEAL tactical torture treatment, (laughs) you're like, God, please let this kid sleep. Like, he has to sleep, right, God? Like, everybody has to sleep. That's how you designed this guy. Like, you you know what I mean? Like, you're never more closer. And I think sometimes we forget that. People come into therapy and they're like, just get get the anxiety away from me. I don't want to be depressed anymore, right? Some of those things are anointed, you know? Um, number two, um, in here, I would tell them, like, try to make more decisions out of fulfillment than deprivation, right? A common theme in here was this feeling of I'm missing something, right? Like, I'm going to miss my inheritance because of Joseph, right? I'm going to miss um, my inheritance because of Ur's son, right? Like, these these God-sized holes that people try to feel with stuff, right, just creates fear, 
And then fear begets distortion. It distorts the truth and it puts us into survival mode. And I think you'll see in here when people are in survival mode, man, we, when we're in survival mode, when I'm in survival mode, I come up with all kinds of creatively dysfunctional uh, ways of getting my needs met, right? And so if you kind of act from fulfillment, meaning turning in and turning towards this ideal that God is working here, then it allows you to be fulfilled. Number three, I, feel, I think the system needed some differentiation, right? If you haven't heard that term before, it means to be together and separate, right? And in most systems, usually the person who is most dysfunctional sets the culture, and you see that happening from time and time again, set in the culture of the family, the most dysfunctional person, right? Like Jacob, like Judah, right? Um, and so to differentiate, you need one person to step out, somebody to step off this board, reflect back on, and then go, all right, wh what are we doing here, man? Like, what's happening? All right, most systems just need one really well-differentiated person to make it be healthy, right? And again, to do that, we have to have this cosmic perspective like, is this what God wants us to be doing? Is this, are we helping ourselves move closer to him, right? And then number four, my personal favorite, um, which I don't know if it's going to make any sense, but it made sense to me. Number four, I think sometimes you have to get it how you live. Right? If you didn't grow up where I grew up, that might not make sense. Somebody, somebody's getting it. To get it how you live, it means that, man, sometimes this stuff is not pretty. Like, it's just not. Sometimes following God's p path, even generationally, right? You look at the previous generation, you look at your generation, and you look at your kids, and you're thinking it's not white picket fences and sunshine and flowers. Like, it's grimy. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes you do have to be that generation that just grinds, you know? And, I, and I'm imagining that that is what Tamar is doing, right? I would imagine this is, this is me, right, that she's at her father's house and she's thinking, all right, I got to do something, right? And I think God anointed that experience to pave the way for, cur for courage, right? And sometimes you need to do that. You need to have more get, grit and grace, you know, is what I wrote down here. And then lastly, um, <clears throat> is that, you know, throughout this whole experience as I'm reading this and I'm thinking about, you know, how God anoints these experiences and how sometimes we could just recognize his anointed work in them, right, that maybe we can start to make better decisions. I think to do that, we can't spiritually bypass pain, right? You know, like we can't, like, put kind of Christian flowery words around suffering, you know. I mean, we all do that. We have friends, they come, they tell you this horrible story, and you don't really feel like getting into it, so you're like, ah, I pray for you, you know. Like, ah, yeah, I pray for you, man, you know, but you're not. And then they do the same thing, you know, like, well, I have to just pray. And you do. Praying is great, but also do the work, you know. Like, get in there, you know. Because um, <clears throat> you can't. Sometimes... Um, there's some real pain, like there's some real relational trauma in all of these stories. If you think back to Jacob, if you think back to Judah, if you think back to Joseph, these relational trauma sometimes hurt more than physical trauma, right? Think of Tamar's story, right? Like you need to process through that stuff because if you don't, what ends up happening is you lose sight of what's happening. You lose sight of the process, and then you start making transgenerational issues. It's the same thing from generation to generation like we see in this story. It's the same stuff, deprivation, jealousy, fear from generation to generation to generation, right? And so somebody's got to do the work in order to get us out of there. And so I want to leave you guys with this message and I'll close this in, in prayer. It's that, um, and sometimes when we're in a dark place like Tamar, right? Sometimes when we're in a dark place and we think we're buried, we may actually, like Tamar, we may have been planted, right? Like for God's purpose, for God's kingdom, even if we can't see it, right? Now we can look back and see the roots and how these decisions kind of impacted the life. You can't see that there. And so sometimes you just have to act on faith that I've been planted here 
And so I'm going to go find it in the dirt, you know, as my grandpa would say. Um, okay, let me close this in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, as we conclude today's message, um, we thank you for the profound lessons from this story. Um, help us embrace the beauty within our anointed brokenness, God, recognizing that our failures can lead to redemption through your grace. Um, give us courage to take bold steps of faith, just as Tamar did, and to seek justice and restoration in our lives, God. Remind us that our past, it doesn't define us. It doesn't define who we are, but your transformative power does. I um, mean, we leave here today renewed, knowing that you are always working to draw us closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jude. Yeah. Um, as we do every Sunday morning, we are now going to move into our time of the prayer of confession as we prepare our hearts and minds for uh, the communion meal. Um, as we uh, uh, as we have passed the communion trays, if you're not familiar with how that works, there'll be some instructions on the board. So if you'll join me in the prayer of confession. I'll read the parts in white, and if everyone else will read the parts in yellow. Okay, thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we confess to each other and to you, our creator, that we fall short of being what we were created to be, and what we have committed ourselves to be. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of Christ. We often seek out the easiest paths, paths of least involvement in places where we might be uncomfortable, or paths of self-centeredness. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of righteousness. We confess that we have not loved you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Bring us out of darkness, Lord, and into the light of your love. Hear us, forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of light. Forgive us for getting so caught up in the world's trappings and its false messages of hope that we lose sight of the hope of the kingdom, which brings healing and peace to a world in turmoil. Hear us. Forgive us, renew our resolve to build the kingdom of peace. May we resolve to become more kingdom-minded, to be peacemakers here and now. Amen.
Mason, Zeke, thank you very much. That was great. Man, Mason, great voice. I don't think I'd heard that before. That was wonderful. Um, Jude, once again, thank you for bringing the word today. Um, yeah, the, the, the struggles and the anxieties and the fears and the difficulties that we encounter are difficult and we don't want to face them, but sometimes they are anointed and sometimes we have to walk through the fire. So thank you for that word. Uh, I'm going to close us in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to gather together once again. We, uh, we take encouragement from the people around us and for the people that you've brought into our lives. Help us to be open to, the, to your reckless love that comes upon us often in unexpected ways and, and through unexpected people. Help us to be open to your word, to your will, to the, the ways in which you're moving in our lives. And help us to be Christ to other people. Help us to demonstrate the love and the grace and the forgiveness and the welcoming spirit that you bring to every single person on earth. We're sorry for the times when we are selfish and when we are, um, are arrogant, when we are uh, self-aggrandizing. Please forgive us for those sins. And as we go through this week, Lord, I pray that you will keep everyone here safe, uh, encourage them, and allow us to encourage each other. Allow us to see outside of our own skin and outside of our own daily life and daily struggles and to, to reach out to those who, whether we know it or not, may need your care and your touch. And it's in your son's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.